Tonight, the untold story of the Mark 23. A man comes out of the water and we shoot a piece of history. It's all happening now on the 1911 Syndicate. I am unapologetically a fan of the Mark 23. I also think it's one of the most misunderstood pistols of all time. You see, typically Mark 23 conversations go something like this. It was a SOCOM request, and then they tortured the gun, and no one ever used it again. But that's not entirely true. Mark 23 was the focus of arguably the most ambitious military pistol contract of all time. The attempt to create a pistol that all of Special Operations Command would use. To create a pistol so reliable, capable, and ahead of its time that it would be considered the world's first offensive handgun. This is the untold story of the Mark 23. Serial number number five, and I have not shot this pistol in 28 and a half years. Pretty wild to find it out here on the range, and I can't wait to put a round through it for old time's sake. You're not good enough for one hand. Oh, watch this. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome to the show. What I like to think is going to be a really thrilling edition of the 1911 Syndicate because we're really kind of going into uncharted waters. Oh, I like maybe. Yeah. See what you did there? <laughs> Reference. That's not written down. That was actually just uh, a made, made up dad joke uh, there, despite not being a father. We're talking about the Mark 23 today, and sort of as the, the video title may, may imply, sort of the untold story of the Mark 23, because I think this video is going to put the Mark 23 in a new light and add some context that I think is often lacking, and also tell the full story. We'll introduce guests in just a moment, just to give you guys a sense of what we're going to talk about. We'll be covering a little bit about the offensive handgun program. We'll be looking at, oh man, the gear uh, that we're going to be able to show in this is genuinely spectacular. Uh, going from straight up OG prototypes to phase two prototypes to final production Mark 23s, including lambs and suppressors and the whole deal, including doing something that I don't no, James, if it's ever been done on camera, which is shooting the prototype with the slide lock feature on. Has that ever been done, to the best of your knowledge? It was done today. It was done today. <laughs> so you got to stick around for that because anyone that is an HK fan or Mark 23 fan, I mean, that really is kind of a historically cool moment on camera that we will come to. In a little bit, we'll be talking about the Mark 23's real world use and sort of the things that you don't hear in relation to it actually being used in real world. But before we get into that, Hey everybody, quick thank you to the sponsor of today's video. The belts. Oh, look at you. Yeah, I don't care, I'm taking it off. 
Uh, this is the light inner Velcro belt. I have the EDC. Uh, I EDC belt. this bad boy. If you're not using a lot of heavy gear at the range, also a great option. They got the emissary belt battle wagon, right? Yep. You slap the battle wagon under this bad boy. And go to battle. That's the idea. Or uh, to, you know, Walmart. Like, dress if you up on YouTube. want to wear a, a, you know, battle belt around, I, I don't sure. care. I don't, we don't judge you. Um, there's a code you can plug in. It's 1911 Syndicate. Saves you 10% off. We did a couple reviews prior to them sponsoring the channel. Those are linked below, so you guys can check that out. On with the show. Okay, and with that said, let's go ahead. Uh, James has, of course, been with us many times before. Sitting there, he's got his uh, Heckler & Coke... Um, inspired uh if you like donuts we won't say the you know if you like donuts you might appreciate that shirt i really like that shirt and I will, thank you i, I know a guy i can get one for i you. do want one of those shirts my friend <laughs> um but james course from chufo hunt tactical how was that pronunciation that was wonderful it's pretty good it's pretty good um and then we've got Dave Hall, uh, Dave, first timer on the channel here. So why don't you kind of give a snapshot of your, uh, obviously you, you have a deep, rich background with the Mark 23, which would be, you know, a big mm -hmm. emphasis of what we talk about, but maybe give a snapshot of the background for, you know, people meeting you. Sure. Yeah, so I'm a retired SEAL, retired senior chief, 21 years in the Navy, uh, all of it on the East Coast teams. Came in at an interesting period to, to encompass those years. So I came in, in in the teams in 88 and retired in 2007. And so it turns out I transitioned that that bridge between Vietnam tactics and people that were still, you know, my instructors and teammates that were Vietnam veterans and went through that all the way through the modern uh, global war on terror. And, mm -hmm. and we did business very differently, saw a lot of changes, and um, uh, both in tactics and in, in equipment. And we'll talk about just particular piece today yeah very very cool okay so dave walk us through we have a makeshift um hide site yeah it's a fake if, hide site if you will and we're going to kind of progress to more of a real deal hide site from mm -hmm. our training ground here so kind of maybe give us some backstory on what we're dealing with and why yeah so I, you know i would had uh quite a while in the teams i'd had 13 and a half years or so in the teams before i went over to sdv and uh, I knew the guys that were running the program. They said, hey, when we go to the square range, we got a box. We're going to put you guys in to shoot out of. And it reminds me of uh, the VTAC, uh, shoot through the geometric spaces thing. But oh, it's, yeah, yeah, But it's on your stomach. And, and it, was a, it was a more inclusive box than this. And I was like, what's this all about? And they said, uh, this is so you get used to shooting odd positions because you're never going to have a perfect position in your hide sight. And then they would do stuff like use hide sight material in it to show you if you get the the slide up near the netting the netting just has this magic way of getting in your in your slide and yep. jam into the ejection port yep so this was just a thing we trained to um did do it every single time we went to the range but we definitely we brought new people in yeah that were going to go into the hide with us so they yeah. kind of understood sneaky sneaky it's stuff. sneaky and you get a little bit of reverb in there and um and it's tight and uh it gets a little more comfortable with your but you two are tight so super I, comfy yeah with exactly We're comfortable with each other <laughs> Um, yeah. What are you implying, Dan? I've seen your videos. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> um, okay, so what do you want us to do? Get, get in the site? Yeah, so uh, Jay, you can go ahead and take the side and. Close mirror zone. And Chris, you take this side here, and then that, that'll be your lane over here. And we're, so the, the clearest ports are the ones that are down on the bottom. The nets aren't around that. So try to work uh, that you can get in a position and. I'm gonna tell you right now, 90% of the time, you cannot get your sights aligned straight up and down. You're gonna to have to do these these canned shots. So work through the clear ports first and get some hits and uh, contort your body to get those hits. Okay. And then when you feel comfortable, oh start working that top port. Okay. And man, again, that net's waiting to jump in your e-port if you let it get up there too too high. Cool. So you back away from the uh, <laughs> from you back away from the hole. So there's two ways. Yeah, try both. Okay. And the reason why is there's um, it's sneakier to shoot Boy, if you're back in your hide. Um, if you stick the the weapon outside the hide, right? Visibility is up. Visibility is up. The blast that you receive inside not as bad, mm. but your position giveaway on the other side, you'll blow leaves or materials uh, out, and and so whoever's looking for you might uh, might might get an indicator of where you're at. Man, straighten out, dude. I gotta get in there too. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> Ready to go? Yep. Yeah. Okay, send a couple. Yep. All right. 
All right, you guys want to try the top? Yeah, in the second position? Yep. yep. Boy, that one's tricky. That fucking thing. Oh, my God, that's rough. Man, keeping your iron sights is tough. Yep. Because the shit keeps getting in the way of my sight picture. Well, and you're giving us away with your muzzle out the fucking hide sight. Well. You're not good enough for one hand. Oh, watch this. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> stupid, stupid co-host. <laughs> okay, so that's not that easy. Oh, no. I'm fully admit that's a lot harder than I thought that was going to be. Oh, I mean, I think I missed one round, so it was easier. No, I wasn't that. missing, but I was working for that shit. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely working. God, like you said, there's no perfectly vertical shots. You're always going to be canted, right? That, well, that's a first time. You know, I've, I mean, I've shot from barricades and, and stuff like that, but that's a unique, it's a unique shooting experience. Yeah. And there's no way, like you had mentioned, that you're getting any bigger firearm than this. Mm. Like, no. you're not getting an AR. Actually, I'd, I dare you to try it with a with a suppressed oh, long Jesus. gun. But again, you got someone laying next ah, to you. Ah, son of a bitch. Yep. That's true. Oh, here we go. This is going to hit right in my fucking sternum. There's no shoulder. I got... And I can't shoot as a righty because I'm blind. Yeah, I'll tell you ahead of time. Expect a, a, a possible uh, jam because you may have jammed yep. right into your forearm. Yep. Yeah, that's probably what's going to happen, but let's see. Good. Far right steel. Okay. Really not pleasant. Yeah, try to do what you just did. And, and that's, that's the why. When people go, why did we care so much about the Mark 23? It's because you just cannot manipulate. Why don't we do this? Why don't we start with just kind of add, add, you know, free flow here. The offensive handgun program and just what that was. Like, what, like what, what was the need? What was the request based on? Like, what is the offensive handgun program? Sure. Um, to talk about that, you've got to go all the way back to 1987, the formation of Special Operations Command, where um, all of the individual service um, special operation components were unified under one singular command that could um, support them in a way that um, was kind of disjointed when they were under their, their sister services. As you might expect, you bring all these units together, and as we're talking about here, weapons, um, walking into a SEAL armory in 1987, 1988, walking into a Green Beret armory, you're probably gonna see an incredible array of disjointed weapons going back to Vietnam and maybe even earlier. And just from a simple logistical standpoint of supporting um, maintenance and you know, spare parts and ammunition, all those kind of things, there was an obvious um, motivation driven from the top to say, hey, we need to kind of unify um, a standardized handgun for our special operations forces. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes challenging because everybody's got a dog in the fight about what they're interested in. For the SEALs at that point, they had already mm -hmm. adopted the SIG in nine millimeter. We're really happy with that. Was it? Okay, we already had that going. Um, mm -hmm. And for Army SOF, uh, they were very pleased with their customized 1911s and 45. Um, so already you start off with a challenge of, of, you know, how do we come together on this? Mm -hmm. Um, but the feedback, especially as they're coming out of Somalia was that 45 was going to be superior as a man stopping caliber, um, over nine millimeter and an intent that if they're going to drive towards a new weapon, that it would be in a 45 caliber. And then they started adding on all these other requirements. So obviously these are these are customers who operate clandestinely, suppressor technology coming in into play in much more advanced mm -hmm. forces and things that they weren't able to do very effectively with suppressors um, previously, especially with 1911s, that became a requirement. Now you have emerging technologies for lights, visible and invisible uh, lasers mm -hmm. um, that are coming into effect. So that gets put onto it. And of course, you have a reliability and accuracy standard that you would expect from special operations forces. Especially with 1911s being in the conversation. Exactly, yeah. so highly accurate. Um, they wanna maintain that capability, but they also understand the, the real downside, Achilles heel of, an, an, of a 1911 in that, in that role was, it's not going to 
be very uh, effective once you put it into these hostile type environments, the sand and salt water environments mm -hmm. that seals yep. are operating out. So now you add in fitting a, things like that on top of it, yeah, you know, you yeah. add in a reliability standard that did not exist at that time. Um, so all of this comes together, put together requirement document, kind of agree on uh, on what they want it to be, and then they put that out to the firearms community to support, just like we talked about in some of the other videos. Um, but I think it could be lost on people who didn't come up in that time frame and are aware of all the weapons that we have at our disposal today, just how monumental a task that was, you would think every firearms company would want to get in on this thing. Mm. And in the end, really, it was just Colt and H&K that Crazy. even came up to the table oh. with a phase one prototype because it was such a daunting task with all the requirements that the other companies just didn't even think that they could um, compete in it. And it comes from a simple standpoint. I mean, you can look at the pistols and say, okay, hanging a big heavy suppressor off the front, hanging a big light and laser combination, just that weight uh, on the front of a weapon is a very difficult thing to deal with and have it reliably cycle mm -hmm. through all different temperature ranges and environmental conditions and different types of ammo and, and, uh, and you know, running dirty through so many thousands of rounds. It was a big deal. So it starts with Colt and with H&K in a phase one prototype testing. And that's where I'm handed over to Dave because he has the really unique um, experience to not only be a SEAL who got to utilize these operationally, but he was involved intimately in, in that phase one through three developmental testing. Okay. Okay, so we're talking uh, prototype, phase one testing, all this kind of stuff. So where do you enter the picture? Uh, <clears throat> well, it's an interesting story. When I went through BUDS in 87, 88, the pistol that we were shooting initially was the, you know, the Vietnam era uh, Model 39. That's oh, what, geez, I, wow. what I qualified in buds initially on uh, in second phase. And then we transitioned to the Beretta. And we had a, uh, we had kind of a bad experience with the Beretta and the slide breakages in my first platoon. So by 89, uh, it was decided, it wasn't just my platoon, it was, uh, I experienced it in my platoon, but um, through the force, there were problems. And, um, and so it was decided that we were going to be authorized to purchase an interim handgun. It was a SIG 226, which we were very happy with it. So by the time that I got involved with the events of handgun program, it had been a concept and um, not, not to uh, be in disharmony with what James said. It was just my perception at the time was that we felt that the offensive handgun program was something that the Army had developed for themselves and then couldn't get, uh, they couldn't get this gun without giving up the 1911. And they didn't want to do that because they were not allowed to have two pistols and 45 caliber in their, in their war room. Something like that's, that was our perception okay. of it. And so, and since we were heavily invested in nine millimeter, it was like, well, we're all in SOCOM and the Navy can take the lead on this thing. And I, I think Crane had a big interest in running that program down. Mm -hmm. So they set up the programmatics for it. And, um, but mind you, a lot had happened since 1987 to when I got involved with it was right after I got back from being deployed for nine months, swimming into Haiti in 94, and then we round that corner into 95, and the program's a go. They've got prototype guns. They need guys to go test it. And I was really known as a big huh. bullet head uh, shooter. I was very well known as somebody that was shooting all the time. I was put in the training department, and they said, we really want you to go and, and evaluate this thing. And, you know, within the command, everybody started talking about it. Well, who's going? You know, what are you gonna? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna say? Yeah. I don't know. They haven't even touched seeing the gun yet. Hmm. In the margins, in '94, we came back from a Mediterranean cruise and told we're gonna go straight to Haiti, and one of our sister platoons from another team had gotten down there to cover the, you know, the operation before we got there, and we had heard that a couple of the guys that we knew picked up uh, USP 40s. Okay. And that was all the rage. And we thought, wow, that's not even a caliber that we have in our armory. But they were doing so many ship takedowns and boardings and stuff that, that, that the features of the USP, even though it was in a dissimilar caliber, made them invest themselves in it. And so we actually considered, like, hey, maybe we should go pick some up. But we just didn't have enough time in town to do hmm. that. So the USP was on our radar uh, on a personal level, on an operator level. And I wondered when HK showed up with, you know, at Crane, when we did the phase one testing, if it would look similar which it kind of does kinda and it kind of kind of doesn't yeah you know yeah. 
Um, but in the interim, also what had happened prior to that was in 93, the uh, Operation Acid Gambit, uh, the feedback that we got from both the SEALs that were involved in that, you know, most people call it Black Hawk Down. Yeah. But the uh, military operations in Somalia, universally we heard uh, that 45 was effective. And we were shooting ball ammunition. Huh. You know, we weren't given all this high-speed hollow-point ammo. Mm-hmm. So it was, you got 9-millimeter ball, you got 9-millimeter 45. Universally, everybody said, well, the 45 stuff worked pretty good. So there was no, nobody had hardship that I've ever heard mentioned during that era of getting a new handgun that was in 45. The, everybody wondered how you were going to do, how are you going to take the accuracy of, a, say, a match grade or really tuned up 1911 and add these sure. other two features, capacity, right, which yeah. hadn't been done yeah, effectively. Then you had the pair, yeah. pair of ordnance had come out with these frames and stuff, but that was still kind of a yeah. a, a wicked mixture, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And um, and the endurance, sure, because the the endurance requirement, you'll never get that without a lot of back so like constant maintenance, like IndyCar maintenance, right, right, maintenance right. on a highly tuned nineteen eleven. Yeah. So everybody was kind of like, I don't think this is gonna be a great mashup, maybe. Then the other thing is when we started looking, I immediately went, well, show me what the features are. And then you go from, oh, it's gotta be single action, double action, decocker, and oh, have a slide lock on it. And it seemed like seemed like somebody passed a hat around all of the soft all forces. Yeah, yeah. And everybody was insistent on a on a thing and nobody there was like no authority to go, no. That's what it seemed like to us at the time. Huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so phase one testing was where they took uh, two of us, two or three of us SEALs, a uh, couple of Green Berets, and uh, one or two people from uh, AFSOC, Air mm. Force Special Special Operations. Hmm. And we were just there. We didn't know this because, you know, when you go to shoot, you think it's training. Yeah. So I'm like, I got to shoot 30,000 rounds of 45 in a week or two? Right on. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think we all thought that. And, and then when one day of shooting, and they're like, you have all of this ammo to go through. And we have to document every malfunction. Yeah, and, and it was all of the first prototype guns. Mm. So we, pre- we quickly realized this is more like robot stuff. Yeah. We're going to be out there just going bang, 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 bang. Document what, what went wrong, if anything went wrong. Let the engineer. Because the engineers were great. They were just bringing up carts of loaded magazines. Imagine huh. that. To, you know, eight, and, 8 o'clock in the morning till, you know, five or sometimes seven o'clock at night just shooting going and it was freezing cold in indiana it was there was snow on the ground and so we were working on their range where it was heated on the inside and you, and you stepped out and bang 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 banged away with the magazines no way. <laughs> and, and come in and uh and go to the next gun and they had a really interesting system like we weren't issued a gun and told go do all this sizzle all this ammo just do this gun they had a whole protocol of this gun has to have this many rounds, and then mm-hmm. it goes on to the next phase, which could have been the heat test, could have been the cold test, could have huh. been the salt spray test, uh, could have had to had uh, the laser put on it and have so many rounds, could have had to have the suppressor. So we were really in the dark on that. It was very well run, um, and it was pretty funny because you could tell those of us that figured out, like, hey, man, we're just here to give our overall input yeah at the end but basically do this and um you could the guys that picked up on it first were guys so we all came with our slick shooting glasses right like we're going to a shooting school and in the end the the first guy that did it went and got you know like when you work in the machine shop and you got the full Uh visor thing that comes down (laughs) and uh and he goes and we all were like that looks so stupid and before the before we got even we were halfway through the week Everybody had them. We were fighting for them. <laughs> and at the end of the day, the funny thing is that you'd go over to the deep sink and just shh, because they were just, we looked like barnstormers, Cake. just covered yeah. in carbon. <laughs> we wore uh, black, or, uh, blue hooded sweatshirts back then, and that front was just completely covered in carbon. So the end result of that, uh, to sh- shorten that up, was... And we, this is the phase one prototype. Phase yeah. one, and it's really just the uh, endurance testing portion yeah. that we were involved in. Uh, they did then bring us in and set us down. They had a really um, detailed questionnaire asking us, what, what are your thoughts? What do you think? What can be approved? And I think it was pretty clear to us that there was no way, because there was a timeline for phase two to open up. And the, the Colt, we were like, Oof, the Colt just isn't going to make it. Rough, you know, yeah. Colt was overweight anyway. They came in blowing the, mm. the weight mm. thing. But so the, the quick takeaways were, 
going into it kind of with a jaundiced eye, like, do we even need this thing? And is are there too many asks in it to begin with? Is it going to be a waste of time and money? I, we were all really impressed that that gun fits the box that the government made. They said it has to weigh this much. It can't be you know more than this wide. It can't be more than this tall. It has to have these things on it <coughs> that do these things. That, yeah. it, it, it did all of that. So then it came down to nuance, which I think in for phase one article of anything, you're you're in pretty good shape, I yeah. think, as a company if you came right out of the gates. Uh, the other thing I want to make a note of is that that O-ring on there, no one in the world had ever seen anything like that. And when we saw it, I mean, it looks to first glance like something that you pull out of Office Depot. Sure. All right. Hit me, hit me uh, my gun to slide lock back there. Yep. Well, may as well, may as well <clears throat> describe it. James, why don't you describe what that is? We, yeah, we've so, talked about this on the channel before, but it's such a fascinating feature. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's of, kind of amazing. One of the challenges of this specific requirement was to get away from the match grade, you know, armor level uh, necessity to change things out. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just take your 1911 and just grab an extractor you know, from gunpartswhatever.com and drop it in. It's got to be fitted. It's, you know, things got to be tuned. So everything that was in these weapons had to be off the shelf parts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, part of the long-term endurance testing was they would shoot so many rounds through the gun. And then when they take it apart to do the minor cleaning, they would remove this part, go into this uh, drawer, pull out that part, put it in there, and it had to fit. Mm -hmm. without any kind of fitment, and then it had to continue on. So to be able to get the match grade accuracy that this contract required out of a, you know, a standard parts um, pistol required some, some real fine work. And that's where H&K came up with this O-ring design. Mm -hmm. What you normally see in a tilting barrel um, design pistol, Browning short recoil system pistol, is as you know, the, the weapon goes into recoil, that barrel is going to move slightly down and tilt and the slide goes back. What that means is as the barrel's moving is every time you fire, the barrel is in slightly a different position than right. it was before. It's not consistent. Yep. And it can bounce around in there. So what happens is the O-ring is placed in the exact position of where the opening in the front of the slide is, that tang. Mm -hmm. It's right and, here. And when and you fire... Is Exactly. Right there. When you fire around, the pressures associated with firing, that bullet as it goes down the barrel will cause that O-ring to swell. Yeah. It'll center the barrel in the center of that opening on the tang yep. and make sure that it's in a consistent place every single hmm. time it fires. And that's how you get your match grade accuracy. And, and I mean, that's such an amazing innovation. It's fascinating that you don't really see anyone else do that. Uh, maybe that's just patented stuff that like no one else can do, but it's like, that is just German engineering at its wisest moment. But like, also, dang. Incredibly mm -hmm. stupid simple. Exactly. In, right. in, in a beautiful way, yes. right? Like, right. I mean, yeah. when it's explained, you're like, well, that makes perfect sense. Exactly. You, but this we, is the you, first time you, we've seen it. We, what we've seen, especially from earlier German designs from H&K, are very complex ways to solve these problems. That's a really simple one that looks like they just went down to Home Depot and, right. and grabbed a washer and threw it on there. But, yeah. but well, it works. And cool. I was going to, as we're saying this, and I'm thinking, the first time I saw that was in 95, early 95. Yeah. And I, I remember looking at that and thinking, okay, that can't be some just average rubber. Yeah. And and then the crane engineers knew enough about it to go, well, no, it they it has a this many rounds and then you change it. Mm -hmm. So, it's 5, so you Yeah, I think it's 5000 right. rounds right. and then and it you, ships and then with you, five o rings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So think about that. So by that that period of time, they come out with this revolutionary method of having a what is essentially an accurate barrel bushing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's made out of something that you would typically say degrades with petroleum yeah. products, sure, right? Yeah. And they have a consistent like this good for five thousand yeah. rounds, yeah, every time, yeah. and then change it. So, I think there's a lot of uh, slide rule work and testing and chemistry that went on behind the scenes. That, again, the the firearm itself doesn't get credit for a lot of those things. And I agree with you. I I don't understand it. Maybe it's a patent thing, but I think that. Um, there's a couple. There's about three features on this gun that I think all firearms right now would benefit from had mm -hmm. they had they incorporated them as a standard. Yeah, and that is huh. that's definitely one of them. Very very cool.
All right, you ready for the next thing? Well, this is the thing we kind of found it out by accident, and it's that with that suppressor on and the overall length of the of the pistol, you tend to be able to just point shoot. You don't actually have to use the sights per, for a considerable different uh, distance. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Take All them right. up. So we'll tape them up. About like that. Yeah. So you see how I got, as I got more familiar with it, I could extend my range. So I, I think I definitely could pick up my pace. I could go faster because the closer ones are easier to hit. Stare at the target. Okay, just stare at the target. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pretty neat. Because <laughs> I did not focus gun at all. I was purely target focused. I know. What do you think? Very little effort. Yeah, I mean, like you, you said, just stare at the target. Yeah, I think you could. And there's only, you only dropped one shot, or a couple at the end, mm -hmm. and you were going for more distance. But you could easily double your speed. Okay. Getting through that space to here, I bet you if you said, hey, I'm just going to go twice as fast, you'd smoke them. Okay, so while we're sort of at the end of talking about phase one and testing and all that stuff, why don't we show the phase one prototype yeah. that, um, you know, has made its way to the wild here. Yep, so this was uh, one of the guns that we used in, in phase one and... The chief complaints, uh, although everybody, you know, people are still trying to get their mind around the size. Yeah. But sure. after a week of shooting that many rounds through it, you realize it's not the weight. No. With all the stuff on, maybe a little bit. With the this can on it, and, and this being a square can, I think that was the first time anybody saw a square can. Sure. So we're all like, what are they trying to push on us? Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of <laughs> what magic is this? Um, the German magic. Yeah, I think people, you know, suppressors are supposed to be circular. So I think people are getting their mind around that. The size of the lamb and its performance, you know, the, the even for uh, 95, the white light was was pretty dim. Um, well, let's describe what the lamb is for people that don't know. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an assumption some people don't know what the hell a lamb is. So the lamb is is this. Laser stands for laser aiming module. And it was supposed to have the active, which means visible, um, or infrared invisible to the naked eye, laser combined with a light, and you could select between the two. Mm -hmm. Or you could select, I want the light with the with the visible laser, right. for example. You know, we looked at this and I was like, man, that thing is huge. Yeah, You're just smart. trying to imagine that footprint in a holster. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it didn't seem super durable. And like I said, the, back then, we didn't even have white lights on our SIGs. Huh. So, but we knew enough to know we probably need more light than that, than that officers, yeah. you know so we we're kind of like yeah but they you know they're like hey we get it the accessories are all part of the thing so say what you got to say about that but a lot of the reservations that we had about the gun itself i don't i don't specifically remember any of us coming to the conclusion that the slide lock wasn't necessary mm. but i think somebody did and i think it was a great idea because <clears throat> it really i think that was a holdover from vietnam I think there was somebody that gave input that used a you know a, a Model Thirty Nine Hush Puppy combination uh -huh. that had the slide yeah, lock yeah, yeah. on it. Say, hey, yeah. it's got to have that or it's not quiet. Sure, and um, and it's just a different technology of uh, mm -hmm. suppressor. Mm -hmm. And I think we started to find out as we were shooting them, both slide locked and non. And oh, by the way, we were also shooting the Plus P, uh, one hundred eighty five oh. grain cartridge. So some of the times that we went out on the range. We had to use the magazines that were loaded with the Plus P because this, this thing had the most incredible endurance testing. So many 230 grain, uh, 230 grain ball rounds, so many Plus P rounds had to go through it at different intervals. And so Dave's talking about the slide lock feature. So what we're going to do, we're going to cut to a, a pretty awesome little demonstration we put on earlier today. In an effort to show you how quiet the Mark 23 is, we will now perform a practical demonstration. 
1911 syndicate sells you real estate. We do it anywhere in the United States, including Alaska, which is kind of like the US. You can also find us on Patreon if you would like to give us your money. You'll also notice I'm not flinching because my ears are not being rung. Go to 1911syndicate.com. Thank you for the support. So we have a really unique opportunity here today. This is one of the surviving phase one prototype uh, Mark 23 pistols, actually from H&K's Gray Room, and they've given us the privilege to actually uh, shoot it on the range to demonstrate one of the unique features that was only um, evidenced in the original phase one prototype. There was an initial requirement for a silent first shot capability where they wanted to have maximum clandestine uh, opportunity and eliminate the full eight step cycle of operation and all of the sound associated with firing a cartridge. So what you can actually see here is if we look inside the trigger guard at the forward edge, this little tab, and then we can see the normal uh, slide lock position here cut into the side of the slide. If we pull back ever so slightly on the slide and push up on the tab, we have now locked the slide in position. This will allow me to fire around, but the slide won't go back to the rear. Silent first shot capability. This is a uh, bucket list moment here for you guys. Okay, the next iteration we will do, just comparing different, um, whether slide lock, reciprocating slide, and then kind of just showing you different sound comparisons with the cans. Uh, this will be just a normal, uh, modern, if you will, Mark 23 with the uh, B&T can that uh, I would just stay tuned and see if you can get these. Maybe you can, maybe we luck out and these hit the market. So this will be just a round on the B&T can. Okay, consensus from the group, we all seem to agree. This was more loud or louder uh, than the prototype with the slide lock and the OG can. Signing off on that? Louder. 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 Pretty cool. Well, oh, sorry, I was, I was just reiterating. But thank you, thank you to the group. <laughs> uh, so now we have a more modern Mark 23 with the Knights can. That identical to yours. I, I was like behind was the gun, quieter. so like I I, you know, a little bit quieter. Yeah. Little bit quieter. A little bit more quiet. Person. Okay. Mm -hmm. So consensus is a little more quiet. Little quieter, I'd say yeah. a tad more quiet. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Port noise is what I was getting. Okay. Now we're gonna show the night's can after it's been wet, and this was something that we were uh, we did quite a bit when I was in the military. I'm saying that was quieter. Oh, significantly. 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 Yeah. significantly. Even then the slide lock, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. But yep. by a good slide. margin, that was the most quiet. So I think I think that was the re the side the sighting factor in why they omitted the slide lock was to go, you could have those follow-up shots and it stays like that for about three rounds. Mm -hmm. And then which is not bad. Yeah. Send one more then. Yeah. Let's hear what the subsequent right. shots sounds like. So I have serial number number five prototype, and I have not shot this pistol in 28 and a half years. I was one of the guys involved with the phase one, two, and three prototypes, and I am absolutely certain I've shot this gun before. It's pretty wild to find it out here on the range, and I can't wait to put a round through it for old time's sake. That was pretty cool. All right, what do you guys think? Which which were, was the loudest? Where does this, where does this compare, compared to the last one, the wet? Modern KC. Wet for me was most quiet yeah, by far. Wet is the most yeah, quiet by far. It's about yeah. in the middle, I would say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's mid tier. The the ninth solo, actually pretty Impressive. good. Impressive. Yeah, yeah, it's actually pretty good. Of course, you can't get them for like less than whatever thousands of dollars, but um, pretty damn cool. 
you guys want to see this? So this is uh, the markings of soot left on a slide lot cartridge. The regular ones coming through don't when you do it semi-auto don't look like that. And this is a keeper because I haven't shot this gun in 28 and a half years. It's going in my pocket. It's a piece of history. So super cool. Thank you, HK. So that was phase one initially. Yeah. Going so, into phase two. So phase two. So phase two, phase one was like in January, I think, of ninety five, and then around February of ninety five was phase two. And I was the only person from phase one that went to phase two, fortunately. Hmm. And I was really excited about it because I heard it was going to be held at Rogers Shooting School, which okay. I had just attended a few months before. And that school is vicious. It is probably the best. Whoever put phase said the, it, that they should take this handgun and put it through uh, Rogers sh Shooting School as a test was spot on because I don't think there's a better test of a, a handgun, whether it'll shoot under stress because every kind of a stress that you will get will happen there. Yeah. So um, even still, when I went, uh, <coughs> I, I was privately saying I want to go there because I had just been and shot very well there. I want to go and shoot this gun better than everybody else and then badmouth it in the, uh, yeah. in the AER and say we still don't need it, you know, because it's still, I think in my mind at the time, I was like it still has too many things going on. Yeah, so you weren't really a fan in, in the beginning. No, I mean, I was... I, I, I was uh, impressed with the engineering part of it, but, but I program. wasn't sold on whether do we yeah, even yeah, yeah, need yeah. the thing. Yeah. Cool, you know, that would be a safe way to say it. Okay. So, and there were some really notable people there. When probably one of the best shooters in the teams was also there um, from from our tier one unit, uh, and I knew him from shooting competitively. And then a legend in our community, R.J. Thomas, was there, who had famously held off all these uh, VC from overrunning his crashed helicopter when his helicopter was riding and got shot down basically single-handedly with a 1911. So <laughs> you've got this 45 legend. 1911 legend yeah. and a Navy cross for it. And we're on the range with him. And, and it was funny because we all thought, we all thought that he was uh, in, the inspiration for all this stuff that we thought mm -hmm. was huh. not necessary. And then once we all got in the same place and talked, we found out no. And not only was he there for the same reason, he was like, well, I'm just going to make sure this thing isn't he wasn't there to sabotage it, but he wasn't there to give it a pass. To help. <laughs> but the other guy from the Tier 1 unit, he and I, within 48 hours, were like, privately, I'm here to sink this thing. So am I. Uh, and as yeah. it ends up, by Wednesday of that week, I think he and I were like, this thing is actually badass. Funny. So you're shooting under so much stress, you're forced to deal with the gun and see what the potential of the gun with you is. And it was better than... It was far more accurate, far more powerful, far, it just, we could do everything with it. Uh, we were doing dueling trees out to 100 yards from the holster, no way. he and I against each other out there. <laughs> so when it, when it ended, I was pretty much sold. And so then I had to be the guy that goes back to the command that I told everybody, hey, I'm gonna go sync this program. Yeah. And I come back and go, hey, wait, just wait. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> That's cool. Funny, okay, and then so why don't we show off kind Phase of two? You know, what that would have been. Mm -hmm. We've clearly got some design changes, but also clear changes on suppressor and the lamb. Yeah. So we didn't, I don't recall that we were introduced uh, to this this suppressor, the night suppressor, or this lamb that soon. Okay. They definitely were issued. Mm -hmm. um, I think we just had the guns. Okay. Uh, and they concentrated on that because we weren't doing speed draws from the holster with the light right, and laser right. and all that stuff. They might have had a couple out there to test and that was about it. Uh, the biggest difference immediately was the finish. We were like, what's going on with that? Because it's just like somebody hit it with a yeah, spray, spray, spray can, can you know. Yeah. Um, High gloss, right? But this has now become iconic. I think it's a really durable finish and um, yeah, it's it worked really well for what's us. What's it meant to do? It's the maritime finish, is that correct? I think, I think the lessons that they learned, and I don't think they did very bad at all during the salt spray testing, but the lessons that they gleaned from the phase one uh, endurance testing when it came to salt exposure, salt water exposure, they decided to go with something that would, uh, it's not going to be pretty for the long time, but it'll keep keep it from rusting for the long time. So they okay. opted out a long ter term beauty uh, for performance and it did that. That's exactly what it was like. Mm -hmm. um, we. Uh, some of these phase two guns, and while we were there, it was pretty cool because if somebody was like, hey, I think this edge is sharp or whatever, we, they had armor there for phase two that would just grind it down. You could slap uh, skateboard tape on it or whatever you needed to get through the course or whatever. But um, by the time yeah, by the time we got back, 
and we saw in the heel had been incorporated and we're like they're listening they're listening because it's not flat like this and it was much easier to shoot especially one-handed so um so then we waited to see what's going to happen now um we went to a phase three, and then we waited for the delivery of the guns. And phase, so. phase three was uh, more CQB oriented, to my understanding. Yeah, it was more putting it through the paces of stuff we already do. Yeah. So they gave. We had been given holsters. I've got mine here. This is the holster that I got when I went to phase two. I was issued that holster, and I was issued the black magazine pouch that's on the belt right there under that gun. This guy? No, the mag pouch. Yep. Mm. Yeah. So the pouch is on here. Yep. So th these two things were issued to me. 28 years ago Man, that's wild during phase two testing and um and they've held up all these years yeah i was gonna say they look them, yeah. <laughs> 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 they've been in the ocean more times than i could remember so so is this um ultimately pretty spot on with what was actually you know given the contract and you know yeah minor adopted. changes they get they got rid of the front slide um serrations on mm -hmm. it and when it was adopted for us socom it changed the markings on there, yep. so the actual model says U.S. SOCOM um, Mark 23, Yeah, MK23. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so here we are at the uh, real deal, which I'm realizing is probably more... Than you bargained for? Well, it's definitely more difficult than I'm going to imagine the last one was. So this, if that's... So there's a road right there. We did that so that we can get good cam camera angles. But if that was just like this, foliage all the way across, and we went 10 yards out, you yeah. would... That's about... It's about when you yeah. a good eye would be able to go, hey, there's something there. Yeah. And in the nighttime, you, you'd probably walk right into it. Non-existent. I mean, we were walking by earlier, me and our camera guy, Crispy, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, there's the hide. And he's like, what? And Dude, what? I would have never saw that. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. So you'll see uh, the nets. Are you as far over as you can go? You got far right target? Yeah, far right. Are you going to get far left? No. Uh, I can. Or middle. I mean, middle. I can go middle and far right. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, so you're shooting right there? Boy, that is unpleasant. I don't have an option, brother. Even with ears, that is fucking unpleasant. Three, two, one, execute. He's down. All right, good hits. Oh boy. Whew. What do you think? I'm exhausted already. <laughs> yeah, this is not the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> okay, so I, I'll be the first to admit, uh, that is more difficult than I would expect, and also less enjoyable, <laughs> if I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest. This, so what did you think about the amount of foliage that was between your your bowl yeah. and the target? So that's that for me was the biggest challenge is, I could barely see the targets, and right. then trying to index sights on a target through a heavily wooded area. And that, I mean, we're talking, I mean, the amount of woods between the target and us, actual woods, 10 feet. I was gonna say six feet, to, you know, right. let's round up and sure, be generous ten. to 10 feet. And it's like, I can barely see the damn target, man. Yeah. I think I'm on a target right there. I would say if you can light them up one more degree. Completely floods out the target. Yeah. Yeah, so and too much in there. Way too much splash. Woo, laser only is really challenging as well. Because it's just hitting all kinds of all shit. Above. Look for that target. Under it. Under it? Yeah. It ain't easy. Well, there's also a possibility this laser is not zeroed for this gun. Oh, shit. Yeah. And then, you know, in terms of, for those of you that get, um, you know, one of the commercial ones, you can obviously... The, the rail system's still the same. So no, you can't attach like an X300 or something like that. You do have a couple options on rails. There's one from HK Parts that I'm just gonna tell you is really not good. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really not good. Um, an X300 just winds up with a giant gap on here and it's just a really clunky system. Um, 
The new one that I found, shout out to a mutual friend, but uh, MP5 Steve. Um, yeah. So I happened to type in Mark 23 because I was just curious if anyone was doing recent videos. And I pulled up a video and he talked about this rail from a company called Lobos Industries. And I was like, well, hey, that's pretty neat. And it actually allowed a, an X300, or in this case, an XLV, XLV, right? I always feel like I get XLV2, it back with yeah. XLV2. Basically, cool guy, surefire, laser light combo, all that. Um, <laughs> It's a way better system if you if you got to mount current stuff and, on a Mark 23. And I can tell you it works because he oh. came to one of our handgun courses oh, at really? this range and ran it in an appendix carry holster with skinny jeans. Dude. It, was, it was quite a sight. Shout out to MP5 up. Steve. That's what's up. That's <laughs> hilarious. Um, That's awesome. So the Lobos rail and, and full disclosure, like I've paid for these, like, you know, so shameless plug, but not shameless, like I paid for them, but it is a good um, product if you guys want to throw lights on. Suppressor wise, so. The reality is Mark 23 has a, its own thread pitch, which is? Correct. So unlike the, uh, the USP series, it's the opposite direction. Yeah. So when you order a suppressor, this is something you obviously need to know, yeah. is which direction you need to go for which weapon. A lot of the newer suppressors will have mm -hmm. the actual booster set on the back, and mm -hmm. you can change out that one piece, yeah. and you can have one suppressor that will fit both a USP tactical and a Mark 23, but you need to know that going in. Yeah. Do you remember the thread pitch in the Mark 23? I can't remember. It's, it's, it's the thread pitch is the same. It's it's left hand versus right, right hand, hand twist. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's pretty neat for some of you who may have spotted this, who are like, okay, yeah, I'm aware of the square OG suppressor. I'm aware of the night suppressor. What's going on here? So I'm going to tell you my uh, understanding to the best that that I can. So. B and T OEMs, uh, certain uh, components for HK, largely suppressors. You know, they make some certain rails and things. B and T is really good at making high quality niche application things. They're like the champ at that sport. Um, and there was this rumor that they actually had a Mark 23 can back in the day. And, and um, my buddy Austin from uh, TFB, when we were in Switzerland, yep. actually kind of brought this up and they're like, yeah, that it actually was a thing because B&T makes a lot of cans. So long story short, we kind of hit up B&T. We're like, hey, look, we're working on this Mark 23 video. And um, so you can't hold me to this because the reality is I don't know. Um, but I do believe that B&T is working on a small run of their Mark 23 cans here in the U.S. The thing is really cool. And in terms of it, a, a an appropriate suppressor for the Mark 23 that you can is like, current that you can get because really a cat can i mean good luck you know i mean i don't know four grand i don't, I don't know i'm taking a guess um that is a very cool sort of unicorn option that i mean i would just sort of stay in touch with the bnt dealer world just to see um if and when these come out but it's very cool i won't show you the booster assembly and all that but it does have some pretty unique features i think austin from tfb will have an article that comes out on the can around the time this video comes out but pretty neat, and again, for the Mark 23 fans, that's something to keep your eye on, because it's not very often that you're like, hang on, there's another Mark 23 can? And to my understanding, basically the CAT can was servicing the US market, and then the B&T can was servicing the Euro market because of import exports, import exports and all that kind of stuff, which is all above my pay grade, but that's the Cliff Notes version of the story. But you can get pretty cool guy modern on an old school 90s gun just with the swap of a couple of accessories which to me really keeps this thing even more relevant because just like, look, man, you get, and from a shooting experience, that's one of my favorite guns to let people shoot when I just like take friends or buddy in town or something out to shoot because it's one of those just... It's like, an experience. Yeah, it's just one of those amazing guns to shoot, you know? Dave, what other accessories do you have laying around here? Um, you got all kinds of holsters yeah, going on. So, so there's this lore on the, on the internet that uh, oil seals never used them, and uh, they were a boat anchor, so on and so forth. And I would submit, well, if, if why do I have six different, and there's one missing, I have like a seventh holster that <laughs> yeah. I was issued. Um, why do I have so many holsters for a gun that I, I never used? Um, so we had various holsters like this style. Oh, that's cool, I haven't Come seen that on. yet. So this is how we swam them. This no is, way. This is how we dove them and swam them. Um, when I was uh, when I was at that uh, SDV team, this was typically how we carried them, and uh, and it's interesting because if you took this off and you put it in the pocket that is for it, so if you want to carry it, oh, so that's a suppressor sleeve. That's a this okay, is a I suppressor a holder okay. in case you don't want it mounted, but yeah. we never did that uh, because it actually balances better 
like this. If you put it here, the weight kind of goes like this. And then, well, if you need the gun, you probably need the gun with the suppressor on it. So yeah. we left it on. Boy, that's cool. And that's cool. Uh, yeah, it was, it's crazy. So I had, uh, I had three different colorways of this. I had the tan that was issued. I had black and I had a woodland one. Um, <laughs> oh man, I and, need a woodland one. Yeah, give me that woodland. <laughs> Yep. And the features of this thing are pretty cool too because the lanyard? you can oh you wow, can put this a cool. keeper so when you're doing your long swim you don't have to worry about that. We often did have a, a lanyard anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just in case. Redundancy. Uh, yep. And uh, yeah, this was pretty much the package that we we swam. They had it. Most of them had two <laughs> leg straps on them, and we all, a lot of times would take one off. Um, I'm going to throw in one other thing on mm -hmm. the uh, on the modern side, and then I want to start getting into some of its real world use. So there are modern holsters that you can get. I've got a couple pieces of Kydex that are made. So my original notion with my Mark 23 was actually as a backcountry gun. That's why I wanted it. Cause sometimes we film up in the snow and stuff and I'm like, dude, I'm gonna have a backcountry Mark 23. It's gonna be like super cool. Um, so finally, I actually found a backcountry rig for this thing, right? So it's like a Kenai chest holder from Gunfighters Inc. But it's like- Kenai. Kenai? What did I say? <laughs> Kenai. Kenai, yeah, that's the redneck <laughs> pronunciation. But it's like, look, you know, you can rock something like this chest wise, which I like to think if I ever had an encounter with like a bear or something, like at least you'd go down with a good fight, you know? Um, but it's like, there are modern solutions because obviously it's not like you can go, you know, get any of this stuff. Uh, you know, oftentimes the tail of the Mark 23 is, um, it was a SOCOM request and HK made a boat anchor and it was technically adopted, but no one ever used the damn thing, mm -hmm. which, um, from everything that we've kind of learned leading into the, the video through private conversations and stuff, that's... You would beg to differ. It's not to say that there was the widespread SOCOM adoption, Correct. but to say that it wasn't used would not be an accurate statement. Because I've heard from reputable right. SEALs, yeah. never used, stayed in the armory, we hated them, no one liked them, no one ever used it, never deployed, yada, yada, yada. I mean, from, you know, yep. regular guys. team guys to yep. the tier one guys, mm -hmm. so... So I've seen, you know, I've seen good friends of mine on TV or, or YouTube saying essentially that, and and I don't, I think, okay, that was their experience. I, I'm not saying that that's their sure. experience wasn't true. Right. Uh, I've had a different, much different experience, but I can explain. I think I can explain why okay. the differentiation uh, when our, especially when our service times overlap. So when they first came in in '96 or so, uh, anomaly, everybody was like, okay, what you know, what do we do? So everybody was taking them to the ranges. It was a really cool time to be a SEAL around the mid '90s because we, especially at the command I was at, they'd let you sign your guns out, go shoot them. We had contracts with all the local ranges, so you could grab oh. ammo from the command. You grab your gun, they gave you paperwork. You could go drive out in town and shoot. They'd <laughs> let you take it home sometimes for the weekend. No way. Anything that yeah, if you wanted to be a better operator, they would provide that ability for you to do that. So it was fantastic, and I, and it was probably one of the more popular guns for guys to check out because they were like, you know, what what is this? How am I going to use this thing? It worked. Mm -hmm. um, immediately when we got it, I think people were like, well, you know, I'm really good with the SIG and doing house runs and stuff. The SIG just seems more nimble. Yeah. But um, it came into our community around the time that we started doing, it was a month that we started uh, doing some cold weather training. And uh, a bunch of us gravitated towards it because your hands don't freeze if you have to use it for anything and it's cold out an aluminum frame hunt a sig will get cold yeah it oh, really that's what you really mean. cold you absorb weather. the heat through the gloves real quick it, it sucks the warmth right through the, yeah. the gloves yeah, and the cold yeah and then the other thing is you, we didn't have suppressors for the sigs sure so the buy-in yeah. was if we're going to do a cold weather stuff which a lot of times the cold weather uh missions that we did involve some sort of reconnaissance mm -hmm. so here we are trying to be sneaky and back then in 96 ish even though we had the m4s and stuff we really weren't prone to uh, patrolling around with cans on our m4s but when you're in your hindsight you're like whatever i'm going to get into this you know thicket and bed down i'll hear somebody coming close i'll just zap them with the Mark 23. So, a subsonic round, 230 yeah. grains. And yeah. so, so you, we started seeing guys using them on training missions more for that. Okay. Um, so fast forward to 2001, 9-11 happens. I was one of the first people deployed within days of 9-11. Uh, of uh, ended up in the Middle East uh, doing missions. We ended up doing two, uh, the, the two very first uh, leadership introduction operations, which was taken down ships that they suspected bin Laden's uh, kids yeah. that were fighting uh, HMLs no were on, and a uh, capture kill mission. And I know at least one guy that carried a Mark 23 uh, on that mission ah. that we were on. Dang. And yeah. 
And it was, you know, nobody batted an eye, like, what are you doing? It was, yeah. it was your choice. The other- And then where does, um, you know, <laughs> Sort of in SBD world, you know, where, where does it? SDV. SDV. It shows, shows you, you know, <laughs> I, there, there's a lot of yeah. holes in my military knowledge, everyone. Yeah, so uh, I made uh, I made rank, uh, at, which afforded me the ability to go to a different command in uh, 2003, two, 2002. And uh, I negotiated for that command and checked in there very early in 2003. And when I did, my friends that had, you know, lured me to come to the dark side, were doing great things over here. Can't tell you what, but you got to come here. When I got there, they were uh, running a program where they had what they called mission specialists that rode in the back of the SDV, and there would be a pilot and a navigator at the front. And, and, and SDV for, you know. It's a miniature submarine, uh, electric-powered uh, submarine that uh, can probably go faster and l much longer than, than you could imagine. Sure. And, um, and it's a way of transporting SEALs uh, typically from a large submarine, but it could be another type of uh, surface vessel, yeah. to to a beach or to a harbor or something, to do something and, and return. Excellent. Yeah. 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 And uh, so physically, that was the most challenging thing I'd ever done. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny because I did the exact reverse of what most SEALs do. Most SEALs pray for, out of buds that they don't get sent to an SDV team. You go to become yeah. a frogman and then you don't want to ever get wet, okay. right? So that's what guys do. And, then, <laughs> and they try to avoid it. And then if they get there, they spend all of their energy trying to get to a, a get out of SEAL there. team and never go back. Yeah. So with, with uh, all that time that I had in already, I was lured to go because they were looking for guys with my background, uh, heavy uh, reconnaissance and sniper background, um, was something they were looking for for back of the boat. <clears throat> and, I, and it was awesome. But when I showed up, um, and these were guys I had put through sniper school that were now teaching me cool. the nuances of oh, cool. how to do recon. How cool from being after being delivered by this mini sub. Yeah. And uh, and one of the first things they were like, "Hey, we we use the crap out of the Mark 23." And I was like, "How so? We're gonna get along fine." <laughs> and you know, they were issuing gear, yeah. specialized gear, like all that stuff that's still in plastic. Mm -hmm. Those are special camis that were made for us by we we went <laughs> to the hunting industry. <laughs> to get uniforms that we could wear over our our wetsuits, go over the beach, take the wetsuit off and everything, put the camis back on, mm. and they would dry while we were walking to our hide site, and then they were excellent. So hunter camis are great for sitting still, which yeah. is what you're doing when you're doing recon. Uh, military camis are good for when you're making a movement. movement. Yeah. So those are special SDV camis that I hadn't even broken out of. Dang, out. that's cool. That's so, really cool. So the Mark 23 was a huge feature. All those holsters, big feature. And there's another thing over there. See that brown pouch by your left foot? This? Yeah. yeah. So we had a special vest made. This is the bottom half of it. The, you've probably seen what the top half would look like. Have you ever seen the radio chest rig that yeah. holds radio mm -hmm. sideways? So we had a special one made that this would be removable if we wanted it to be. But the radio pouch would be up here, and then it had places for signals and strobes, emergency stuff to be recovered. But this is what this was our loadout for going over the beach, and it was three magazines plus the one in your gun for your M4 suppressed, and then these are Mark 23 pouches on the side. So and real light. I mean, you're going in super as light. light as possible. Yep. So and this is from when you were in the teams. Yep. So you could you could crawl on your stomach and slither around, mm. and everything was protected and, and didn't hang up on anything. Uh, we never carried anything on our back other than the backpack. So when you're in your hide site and when you were laying down, you were you were good to go. But this was our this is proof, and this was all the way up to I operated with this stuff all the way up to uh, I retired in 2007. These were still being issued. Um, <laughs> so and as you'll see in the video, the video was taken in March I think of 2006. And those are guys actively training hard with the Mark 23. The reason why I think that the, the it's, it's not a myth, it's just a, 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 some people's perceptions based on their experience. Those guys don't, didn't know what we were doing mm -hmm. because we were doing larger uh, strategic missions that, that uh, even some of the guys that were in my task unit, they would know we were planning to do something, but maybe only myself and the officers or, or another senior chief knew what the mission we were planning for was. Um, so there was a lot of compartmentization of what we were doing. And and, and there's that um, stigma, like those guys didn't, <laughs> it's like, don't look at them too much, you might get orders to go yeah. over there. <laughs> they they didn't really much care about what the diving part yeah. was anyway. But huh. we, um, 
yeah, we were using the hell out. In fact, we tricked them. We tricked them out as much as didn't have to do a lot to them. But we were the only people that I ever saw that uh, our command purchased tritium sights for us. And, hmm. and uh, I have tritium sights on my personal gun. Okay. And um, and we painted them. We painted them like you would your your carbine. So yeah. there's uh, giving you some pictures of mine. You can see they're completely painted up to be everything we did was to be camouflaged in that hide sight. And lower our signature as much as possible. Yeah. I think, you know, <laughs> video like this is really cool because, uh, uh, I mean, this is a third video we've done on Mark 23. Yeah. Um, so it's well documented in advance. Like, mm -hmm. um, we're a fan of, of, of these things. You know, it, it's a cool gun. But, again, that story gets, gets you know, kind of butchered sometimes on... Mm -hmm. Well, and even after two previous videos, you still taught us a ton. James, again, dropping nuggets throughout the whole day of stuff. And then clarifying up, you know, making a little yeah. more clear. It's just fascinating. Well, yeah. it, to illustrate that last point, it just dawned on me. So just before last week, I think I sent you guys a picture of one of my teammates. And he said, yeah, go ahead and use it. And he, he was one of the first uh, uh, SEALs with our Tier 1 unit to go into Afghanistan days oh, after. Really? So I was off the coast someplace else with yeah. a regular SEAL team. He was in Afghanistan, and he told me, he goes, hey, I'm glad you're doing this video because, you know, we used the heck out of the Mark 23 when we were over there oh, that's in cool. 2001 to 2002. And I said, come on. I didn't even know that. <laughs> and uh, he says, no, man. And they dropped that's some cool. names. Like, you know, this, you know, people that I know. He yeah. goes, yeah, man, dude, these were our favorite guns that's over cool. there. So, so wow. yeah, that's an, so you can kind of see why they didn't put that on broadcast. Sure. And even when I was in, I could see people making comments on the internet that they're not being used and I'm going into work using the heck out of it every yeah, day. Right. Yeah. But right. what's what's the bigger fight? Getting on the internet and telling somebody, no, you just don't. Right. You know? no, so, no, no, no. No, but, but this is a cool, uh, you know, pe peek behind the curtain for folks to just go, look, this is a little piece of historical coolness with uh, getting to shoot the prototype, kind of hear, you know, background on the, on the, the testing and the different phases and, mm -hmm. you know, real world use and everything. It's just, you know, we don't get to do a video like this every day. This is yeah. cool for us. I know it's cool for James. James is, you know, Obviously, HK enthusiast would be a fair way to describe you, I think. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's highly ironic, and I'll wrap myself out. As I said before, I went into the phase two uh, with the, to be the spike that spiked the, mm -hmm. you know, Killed the, the naysayer. Shoot it so well that everybody had to pay attention to me and then say something bad about it. And uh, the irony is that uh, when my wife, when I was retiring in 2007, she says, what would you like me to get you for your retirement gift? I wanted a Mark 23, and, no. that's, and that's what's sitting over there. <laughs> so so she bought, and that's how much it meant to me. Yeah. The last four years of my career, I, I don't, other than land warfare stuff where I was, you know, doing urban warfare or something, if it had to do with the maritime, it was definitely Mark 23, and I shot a lot of rounds through it. Yeah, super cool. James, any final thoughts? No, I think it, again, this is, this is the kind of video that I've been wanting to do for years. This is the, exactly the person I wanted to have here telling that story, and I think it it's a great um, kind of bookend to what you guys have already done on your channel on, on the video, and I know the fans are really going to enjoy getting to watch this. So. Yeah, super Glad cool. to be a part of it. Yeah. yeah. Dave, appreciate you coming Dave, out. thank you. Yeah, thank super, you for super sure. You want me to show the, the coin? Yes, the I do want shot. you to show oh, the coin. come on. This can be a final send-off to the video. For those of you diehards that suck around to the end, when I saw the when Dave sent me the photo of this, I'm like, coolest challenge coin ever. And we'll show you guys a proper photo here, but go ahead and talk about it. So uh, I sent you the group photo of us at Rogers when we wrapped up uh, phase two testing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were getting ready to all of us SEALs that were getting ready to leave, and it was only SEALs then, there were no Green Berets or anybody like that. Um, the, the program directors from Crane gave it, all of us that were participants this SOCOM coin and it says it's engraved with an offensive handgun on the other side. And um, I tucked this away for years and um, recently when we started talking about doing this, I'm like, I think I still have that coin. And <laughs> uh, sure enough, so. so Coolest coin ever. You know, a rare you, coin. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah very yeah. rare. So you have serial number five that you use during testing phase. You mm -hmm. have gear that you use during testing phase and a coin. Mm -hmm. When's the last time all of this has been together? So I was telling you today, I laid this holster in this mag pouch next to serial number five and said those three items have not shared the same range in 28 and a half years, since February of 1995. Yeah, so cool. <laughs> well, thank you for and allowing us to- And I got the coin then. To prove yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the thank cool, you the for- The coolest thing in the world. <laughs> thank you for coming on and letting us share your story and, and all your knowledge and experience. We. Uh, Greatly appreciate it. Well, I want to say, first of all, thanks to, to James. You uh, 
you gave the nudge. Yeah, again, I've been talking backside about it. I said, I just don't feel like HK has ever gotten the full credit for this. And I really, really appreciate both of you guys. Hey. Uh, let me come oh, on. Oh, man. Yeah, this, and, this uh, is fun. And tell the rest us. of the yeah, story. This is very, very cool. Yeah, thank very you. cool. All right. Okay, everyone. Uh, another thanks to FLP. Also, thanks to them for staying with us. It is currently, what do we got? Uh, 1030 at 10 night. We're heading into another night shoot right now. Yeah. Um, but FLP, uh, if you guys are ever in some shit that's legally justified, that's not a technical term, but if you guys are in a legally justifiable self-defense scenario. In the woods at night. In your home, the woods would, uh, you know, stay out of the woods at night. How about that? Um, that's what FLP does. It's meant to uh, cover your... Um, you know, all the costs associated with that. Attorneys Give you an attorney to talk to. All of the things that you were going to need if that unfortunate day comes that you were in that scenario. Different plans, whether you travel, family. Single man, no one to wife, care about. Or, or no one that cares for me. Uh, Fair point. He cheated into that as well. Um, so anyway, codes 1911 saves you guys about a third off the service. Check it out. Really appreciate their support.